On December 2, 2008, Jessica Carson and her living boyfriend, 20-year-old Blaine Millam, called 911 to report that they came home from a local pawn shop to find Jessica's daughter dead. When authorities arrived, they discovered a broken and bloody Amora Carson, already in full rigor mortis. It became immediately apparent to investigators that she had suffered from some form of abuse at or before the time of the death, as she was visibly covered from head to toe in bruises, bite marks and blood. An autopsy revealed that the baby girl suffered from prolonged torture on the night of her death, and it was impossible to find the exact cause of death due to the amount of trauma her fragile body endured. Before investigators had concrete evidence to arrest the mother for Amora's death, she incriminated herself by admitting to a family member that Blaine hid crucial evidence under their trailer home. When authorities received a search warrant, they discovered a pipe wrench, baby wipes, and a diaper all covered in blood in a hole in the master bedroom. During Jessica's confession, she claimed that Amora was possessed by a demon that attached itself to her family after using the Ouija board and during an attempted exorcism. Amora died at the hands of her boyfriend. At the time of Amora's death, Blaine was on probation for a second degree felony conviction of child solicitation. Just shortly before he moved in with Jessica and Amora, he snuck into the home of a 13 year old girl, sifted through her underwear drawer and left pornographic images with sexually explicit notes left on them. Despite being a sexual predator, Texas state officials lost track of where he was and this in turn allowed him to live in a residence with a minor that was nothing but vulnerable. During the trial, forensic pathologist Dr. Keith Pinkart testifies about his findings during Amora's autopsy. The first thing he noticed about her body was the bite marks that covered her. In total, she had 24 bite marks that started at her toes and went all the way up to her face. She had spiral fractures to an arm and leg, suggesting that Blaine twisted her limbs until they snapped. She was beaten over the head with a hammer, cracking her skull, damaging her brain, and causing internal bleeding. These injuries caused her retinas to detach. The worst injuries of all were not the bite marks or the blunt force trauma, but the injuries she suffered to her vagina and anus from being sexually assaulted with what investigators assumed was the pipe wrench Blaine had hid under the trailer home. All while these brutalities were taking place, Jessica Carson was sitting in the other room, choosing not to listen to her baby's screams instead of running in to stop Blaine. What could possibly cause someone to commit such an atrocious act? According to Jessica, it was because Satan took over Amora's soul, and if she didn't let Blaine kill her, her soul would be trapped in hell forever. In order to speak with Blaine's dead father, the two used a Ouija board to contact him. Afterwards, they claimed that it went to their heads, and they believed Satan possessed Blaine and Amora after telling Jessica that he was taking their souls. When Jessica was interviewed, she claimed that she was scared of Blaine and was under the control of him the night Amora was killed. However, Special Prosecutor Lisa Tanner claimed that the exorcism was in fact Jessica's idea and is just as, if not more culpable of what took place that night. During the initial 911 call, Jessica was crying and claiming to be attempting to perform CPR on her lifeless daughter. Jessica then went on to claim that Amora was attacked by the family dogs and when investigators saw the cracks in her story, she changed her story to claim that Amora must have beaten herself over the head with a hammer. While standing trial for the brutal torture and murder of the daughter, Jessica exercised a Fifth Amendment right and refused to testify at trial. Shortly after, she was found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In May of 2008, Blaine was given the death sentence, despite his defense team claiming that he was mentally retarded and couldn't have fully understood what he was doing at the time of Amora's death. As of now, Blaine is still currently awaiting death in the Texas State Prison's death row. During the early morning hours of April 3rd, 1982, Stephanie Roper, 22, was just another undergraduate at Maryland's Frostburg State University. On that night, a car broke down on the rural stretch of highway on the Prince George's County, Maryland. Two men stopped and offered to help her. These men were 26-year-old Jack Ronald Jones and 17-year-old Jerry Lee Beatty. These men told Roper that they would take her to a friend's house. Instead, as soon as Roper entered the vehicle, the men pulled out firearms and drove her to an abandoned house in St. Mary's County. It is here that they beat and raped her without mercy. During this prolonged torture session, one of the criminals blurted out the Confederate's first name. Afraid that she'll be able to identify them, they decided to kill her. Stephanie made several attempts to escape, and upon her last capture, her skull was fractured with a logging chain, and she was shot to death. In order to hinder identification, the murderers burned her body and severed her hands. 
It didn't take authorities long to arrest the two ex-cons, as Beatty made it easy by bragging about his exploits. Both men were charged with felony, murder, rape and kidnapping. Both were convicted and given two concurrent life sentences, with the possibility of parole after 12 years. 21-year-old Shannon Christian and a boyfriend 23-year-old Christian Newsom were minding their own business on the 6th of January 2007. The pair were abducted from the Washington Ridge apartment complex in Knoxville, Tennessee. At some point, they were approached by an ex-con named Lamaricus Davidson. On the night in question, Davidson, known as a drug dealer, was on parole at the time, was in a foul mood. Daphne Sutton, his girlfriend, had just ended their relationship, and on top of that, Davidson was broke and needed a car. Davidson decided to carjack Christian and Newsom, robbing right alongside him were Latelvis Cobbins, mutual friend George Thomas, and Thomas's girlfriend Vanessa Coleman. None of the group had jobs, and indeed, most were homeless. What started out as a plot to get a car and some easy money turned into a horror show. Hours after Christian and Newsom disappeared, Newsom's body was found near railroad tracks along Chipman Street in East Knoxville. Newsom had been raped several times with a foreign object before being shot execution style. Newsom's corpse also made it clear that it had been subjected to torture prior to his death. He was found with a sock stuffed in his mouth, his ankles bound with his own belt, his hands tied behind his back, and a sweatshirt tied around his throat with a shoestring. Forensic evidence ultimately showed that Newsom's killers had forced him to walk barefoot along the railroad tracks before shooting him from behind. These shots paralyzed Newsom but did not kill him. The killing blow came from a .22 caliber gun that was fired at point blank range. The final act of the desecration saw the killers set Newsom's body ablaze. While all of this was happening to Newsom, Christian was being held captive in the small dirty house on Chipman Street. For 24 hours, Christian was raped orally, vaginally, and rectally. Christian had her genitals mutilated, and during a botched attempt to hide evidence, she was forced to ingest bleach. Christian's last moments of her life saw her wrapped in garbage bags and stuffed inside a trash can. It took minutes for her to suffocate to death. All four men were convicted of murder and rape. While Davison received the death sentence, the other three men received life in jail. Coleman is the only woman convicted of helping rape, torture and murder Christian and Newsom in 2007. She got 35 years in jail. Suzanne Kappa was a 16-year-old English girl who was beaten, tortured and died on the 18th of December, 1992. She was a gentle and easily influenced girl who came from a broken family. At 15, she started skipping school soon after the divorce of her parents. She spent most of the time at the house of a 25-year-old Jean Powell, a mother of three whom she babysat since the age of 10. Powell dealt in the business of amphetamines and stolen cars. She had recently befriended a neighbour a few doors down by the name of Bernadette McNeely, also with three children of her own. The two women ended up moving in together and shared a bed in the dining room. Suzanne continued to hang out at the house, even though she was consistently bullied by both Powell and McNeely. Despite her ill treatment, she was a willing servant of the women, pampering to their every whim. Powell had been separated from her ex-husband Glyn, but still remained friendly with him. She had two other lovers, Anthony Dudson, who happened to be the 16-year-old boyfriend of McNeely, and Jeffrey Lee, one of the customers. Her younger brother Clifford Pook also visited the house. In November 1992, Dudson contracted pubic lice and blamed McNeely for the STD. His girlfriend, upset by the accusation, shifted the blame upon Suzanne as she also used the bed. McNeely went on to claim that the girl had also stolen her pink duffel coat and also tried to persuade Pearl to become a prostitute. Suzanne was about to become the scapegoat of one extremely dysfunctional and evil household. The group decided on the 7th of December 1992 that it was time for Suzanne to be punished for her behaviour. She was grabbed at the house by Dudson, Powell and her former husband Glyn. Glyn Powell started things off by shaving Suzanne's hair and eyebrows. He then made her clean up the hair and place it in a bin. He then placed a plastic bag over her face and circled her around viciously, hitting her on the head. Jean Powell and McNeely kicked her as she lay curled up on the floor, beating her with a one metre long wooden instrument and a belt. They took her into a bathroom and forced her to shave off her pubic hair to avenge the humiliation both Dobson and McNeely went through when theirs had to be shaved from the lice. Suzanne was locked in a cupboard for two days. She was then moved to McNeely's house over concerns that her loud crime would upset the six children. She was tied spread eagle to an overturned bed by an electrical flex. 
Over the next five days, Suzanne was regularly beaten, injected with amphetamines, and burned with cigarettes. McNeely put headphones on the girl and forced her to listen to techno sample music from the movie Child's Play at Deafening Levels. She then took delight in beginning each torture session with the phrase, Chucky's coming to play, causing Suzanne to scream with terror. Perk and Lee came to the house at one point during the week and witnessed the blindfolded girl gagged and tied to the bed. She'd been lying in her own urine and feces for days. To clean her off, they placed her in a bathtub full of concentrated disinfectant. They scrubbed her so hard with a stiff brush that it removed her skin. Perk then took pliers and tried to extract two of her teeth. The botched attempt to remove them was gruesome. Not knowing what he was doing, he started off by smacking her teeth into chips with the pliers. Irritated that they weren't coming out, he pushed ahead forward where he forced out the remainder of the stumps. Suzanne had one opportunity to be rescued by 20-year-old David Hill, who was asked to sit in at the house. Upon arrival, he heard screaming coming from the back room and asked what was going on. When later he was left alone with Suzanne, she begged him to untie her. He said he couldn't. He was horrified by the appearance of the brutally tortured young girl, but was too afraid of Lee to intervene. He figured they'll make him next on their list. The group learned that Suzanne's stepfather was going to report her as a missing person. Panicking, all six finally agreed that Suzanne needed to be removed from the house. On the 14th of December, Suzanne was thrown into the trunk of the stolen car and driven 15 miles into a wooded area. McNeely was reported to be giggling throughout the entire journey. They pushed her down in an embankment, into Bramble, and then McNeely poured gasoline over her. The tortured victim kept losing her balance and was ordered by McNeely to get up. McNeely had trouble getting the gasoline to ignite, and Glyn Powell attempted to help by using an envelope as a taper. After three failed attempts, a frustrated Glyn went up to her with a lighter and lit her directly on the back. A screaming Suzanne went directly up in flames. The flames lit up the whole forest. McNeely began to sing, Burn, baby, burn, burn, baby, burn, from the song Disco Inferno. Believing she was dead, the four returned to Jean Powell's house, stopping to buy canned drinks along the way. Both Lee and Pook were at the house. Pook asked Glyn if he had done it. Laughing, Glyn said yes and returned Pook's lighter. Suzanne had in fact miraculously survived. After the group had left her, she managed to scramble up the embankment. She then staggered along a lane for approximately a quarter of a mile to a road before being found by three men on their way to work. She told them, over there, in the field, they burned me, they put petrol on me. The men took her to a nearby house and woke the residents and asked Michael and Margaret Coop to call for an ambulance. Michael Coop had said, both her hands appeared like ash, her legs were just like raw meat, and her feet appeared to be badly charred. I was struck by how polite the victim was. She was constantly thanking my wife for her assistance. Suzanne was a heartbreaking sight. Her face was almost featureless. Her raw red hands couldn't even hold the six glasses of water that she managed to drink, and she couldn't bear anything near her legs, which were red from top to bottom. Rushed to the hospital, Suzanne was able to give the names of six of her assailants and Pell's address before falling into a coma. She died on the 18th of December, 1992, without regaining consciousness. Britain, it seems, is very lenient with its punishment for murder. They will receive 12 to 25 years in jail. Tim McLean was a carnival worker, ready to quit the road. The 22-year-old Canadian man had been working the scene for a couple of years enjoying the opportunity to travel and make new friends. He was ready for a more stable life that included marriage and a regular job. He planned to go home to Winnipeg, which was a good 24-hour bus ride from the current station of the carnival. The folks of the carnival had become his second family. They offered to pitch in to get him a plane ticket home, but he declined. He had no problem taking the Greyhound. He brought his ticket, excited to see his parents. On the 29th of July 2008, McLean boarded the bus. He chose a seat close to the back and prepared himself for the long journey ahead. It was 17 hours into the ride when the bus stopped at a station for the passengers to get dinner. A strange man sat alone on one of the benches. McLean was the only person who offered him a greeting and a smile. As the bus began boarding again, the man joined them for the last leg of the ride. He chose to sit next to McLean, although there were plenty of other vacant seats. McLean didn't seem bothered, putting his headphones on and eventually falling asleep. The new passenger was a tall Asian man in his 40s. He attracted some curious stares from other passengers due to his strange behaviour. At 7pm, he was still wearing sunglasses and was holding onto a toilet roll, almost gripping it like his life depended on it. It wasn't long into the evening before the man calmly reached into his backpack, pulling out a large hunting knife. As the bus flew down the highway, he started to viciously stab McLean in the chest and neck. 
McLean, of course, had woken up and was letting out a series of blood-curdling screams. One of the travellers said it was one of the most horrific sounds they've ever heard in their life. The man continued to stab him in a frenzy and the bus being on the freeway had nowhere to pull over. One of the male passengers had yelled at the man to stop. The man had turned around and looked at him and then, without a word, returned to knifing McLean. The bus driver was able to find a safe place to stop. By this stage, McLean had already been stabbed 50 or 60 times. Nobody else made an effort to stop the attack and the passengers were in a mad rush to get off the bus. Trapped directly behind the horror fest was a young man and his wife and her mother. Terrified, they squeezed past the man without harm. The bus was now empty, leaving the poor young victim alone with his killer. The stunned passengers stood outside the bus in shock. People were throwing up and crying, children were screaming, and teenagers were trying to capture the video on their phones. Everyone could still clearly see McLean being stabbed through the windows. A truck driver seeing the commotion around the bus pulled over to offer help. When he learned that McLean was still inside, he demanded that the door be opened so he could try and get him out. He was accompanied by the bus driver and another passenger. They stepped into the bus, covered with blood. The killer was still wearing his sunglasses, didn't seem disturbed by their presence. He was now busy with a new project and had started sawing off McLean's head. The men stared for a moment, frozen in horror. Realising McLean was beyond rescue, they ran off the bus, locking the door behind them. After the killer had finished removing McLean's head, he paraded it down the aisle like a trophy. He took it to the front door and held it up, his face completely expressionless, causing the passengers to scream. He then returned to the rest of the body, where he cut it up into bits and pieces. The traumatised onlookers were then forced to witness an even more gruesome act of depravity. The police had just arrived by this time, but they were unable to yet safely remove the man from the bus. They weren't prepared either to view the killer cannibalise McLean. It was reported that the man was consuming every part of his body, including each of his eyeballs. It took law enforcement over four hours before they were able to capture the killer. All that time, the man was able to eat McMillan in full view of everyone. The unfortunate passengers were also barred from leaving the scene as they also witnessed to a crime. The cannibal also tried to escape twice through broken windows before finally surrendering. He was identified as Vincent Lee. The story instantly made national headlines. McLee's family heard it on the news and realised that their son was on the same bus ride. They weren't aware that he was the victim. His mother later expressed her anger that nobody had stepped forward to try and save her son. Vincent Lee was a paranoid schizophrenic. He claimed that God told him to kill McLean, and after that, God had instructed him to get rid of the body as quickly as possible. Lee had eaten McLean in the attempt to hide the evidence in his stomach. He was transferred to a mental hospital and deemed not responsible for his actions. After only a few short years of treatment, Lee was released back into society with a clean record and a new identity. This action clearly upset many people. Despite the fact that Lee had been treated, the public would have absolutely no warning of his potential danger. The post-traumatic stress that affected the passengers destroyed many of their lives. Lawsuits were filed against the Greyhound Bus Company. They did little more than reimburse the passengers for the clothing they were wearing and a couple of hours of paid therapy. To add further insult to the tragic loss of Tim McLean's life, Bus 1170 was still in service. Greyhound had it cleaned, changed the identifying number and assigned it to a different route. 